All right, well, hopefully you've opened your Bibles to Matthew chapter six. If you're new to Calvary, typically what we do is we take a book of the Bible, we start in the beginning of the book and we work our way through. We've been working our way through the book of Ephesians during, during our weekend services. But uh, we're taking a few weeks to look topically. And uh, last week we began talking about praying what we would call the Lord's Prayer. Some of you come from a church background, you'd call it uh, the Our Father. And uh, there, there's so much to say about this. I wish I could go through every aspect of it, but um, you know, there's, there's always so much time, but there are some wonderful books that are written on this subject where you pray the Lord's Prayer as more of an outline to prayer rather than just an actual prayer. And we started looking at that last week. One of my favorite books, and I, again, I've read several, but my favorite one is by Elmer Towns, and it's called Praying the Lord's Prayer. And I always love to say about Elmer Towns is he is my favorite Baptist. He's the uh, co-founder of Liberty University. I've had the opportunity to, to meet him and uh, to spend some time with him. He, he doesn't remember me, but I'll act like he does. But, but it, it's just an amazing time. You know, you ever, you, you ever sit down with somebody and you go, you really know God, you know, and that was one of those, one of those experiences. So um, I read his book. I love it. I highly recommend it. Um, and and uh, you'll be glad that you did. But last week we began by looking at, at, at the, what we would call the Lord's Father or the, uh, the Lord's Father, the Our Father, or the, the Lord's Prayer. Uh, and, and from the view of how the original hearers would have understood this. And uh, so we started working through that last week. We got so far, but uh, just by way of review, just a little bit, we're gonna continue today, but verse nine of chapter six, he says, uh, Jesus is teaching, and in, in his Sermon on the Mount, he says, pray then in this way. And I put that there on your outline, that verse nine, it says, pray then in this way. Some of your Bibles will say, this then is how you should pray, uh, but last week we made the point that none of your Bibles will say, pray this prayer, because it was never given to be a prayer, but this is how or the way that we are to pray. So the original hearers would have understood this, and I want you to write this down, that Jesus taught this as an outline for prayer, an outline for prayer. So if you weren't here last week, I would encourage you to get that. It's online and uh, get caught up uh, because I, I, think it's, I think it's vitally important. But we, we started work, walking through this as an outline. And so verse nine, he says, pray then in this way. And uh, then we went to the next line and it says, our father who is in heaven. And that was the approach. This is how we approach God. And we said that he is he is a father to me, and that's the relationship that he wants. He wants to be uh, uh, the relationship of being a father to us. And then it says, our father, and uh, we, we made the comment that that means when we say our father, that we are coming to the father with Jesus, and uh, which is why we come to the father with Jesus. So it's me and Jesus coming to the father, which is why at the end of this, you never say in Jesus' name, because he's there with you. You're going to the father with with him. And then we went to the next petition, which was hallowed be your name. And uh, there we talked about magnifying the names of God. And again, the original hearers would have understood this because they were all Jewish. And they all understood that in what we would say the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, they would just say their, their Bible. Um, they had all of these names of, for God and all of these names said something or revealed something about God. So the first one we talked about last week would be El Shaddai, which just means the Lord God Almighty. So they were very familiar with taking the names of God and magnifying them, we would say hallowing them, uh, to, to remind them of who God really is. We hallow the name of God, we magnify the name of God, uh, not so much for his benefit, but for our benefit, because God is not insecure about who he is, we're insecure about who he is. Uh, we're insecure about whether he really is the Lord God Almighty or the Lord our provider or, or the Lord our righteousness. And, and because we're insecure, many times we, we don't even pray. So we begin by focusing in on that. Well, then we went to the next petition, 
which was the first line of verse 10, and it says, your kingdom come. And there we talked about how we begin by praying about the things that are most important to God. You know, most of us, we, what we want to do is we want to jump into what's important to me. But God says, no, no, we're going to begin by praying about what's most important to God. And we said that that takes a little bit of spiritual maturity to do that. So what's important to God? Last week we said, well, it's the gospel. It's, it's uh, that, that the gospel goes forward. It's missionaries and you know, all the things that God wants to do, uh, what he wants to do here at, at, at your church and locally and, and around the world. So we talked about that. And that's where we ended last week. And today we're gonna come to the third petition. Now, as we get into this, um, just, just so you know, this is going to be in two parts, this petition. So there's going to be this week and then there's going to be next week. And, and for me, the big question each week is what do you leave in and what do you leave out? Because there, there really is so much. But as we pray the Lord's Prayer or use the Lord's Prayer as an outline for prayer, this part, this petition becomes for most people the most perplexing. And, and so I, I wanted to take some time and talk through it and uh, see, you know, just maybe evaluate our, our concept of, of God because your understanding of this petition that we're about to look at uh, will change your relationship with God either this way or that way. It's gonna have a profound effect, however you understand this petition. So the third petition there, verse 10, he says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So there on your outline, the petition is, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And uh, the word there for will is the word thelema in Greek. And if you were to look that up, it would be a, a will means, thelema means to denote a will, that which is will. That is, what do you wanna see happen? Cheryl and I have a will. And so if anything happens to us, this is what we want to see happen, but there's a component of this word there on your outline, um, the complete word study Bible, it, it, it adds that, that that which pleases and creates joy. The idea is that if this happens, it's going to create joy. So this, if this happens, this is going to create joy for, for, for God. So it's, it's something that you want to see happen and, and it's good. Now I'm going to share some things regarding God's will today and, and maybe a little bit next week that could very possibly go against uh, your denominational background, the, the denominational church background that you grew up in. And some things um, we see that, uh, some things we were taught in church growing up that we just accepted, but we never really considered or evaluated, is this really true? Is this really true? And some of these things have become very deep rooted inside of us. And I understand that. And so I, I'm gonna share some things, but I recognize there's a lot of different backgrounds here. So at the end of this, if uh, as I share this today and you come up to me and you go, I disagree with what you said, as always, I'm going to look at you and I'm going to say, okay, that's all I've got. I don't have the emotional energy, so I'm just sharing this. So if you, if you don't agree, that, that, that's fine. I'm not mad or anything. But when he says, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, implied in this is that God wants us to know his will. He wants us to know his will. You see, if, if we don't know his will, then we never really know if our prayers got answered or not. You know, because we, we don't, you know, how would we know if our prayers got answered? And some people will say, and certain church backgrounds will say, you know, if it's God's will, I know it's just gonna happen because everything that happens is just God's will. How many of you have ever heard of something like that? Okay, so, so some would say that. Well, if everything that happens is God's will, then, then why does he ask us to pray that his will would be done? I mean, if it's already going to happen. It's not like I get up every morning and I pray that the sun comes up. It's just going to happen. Uh, so so the, the idea here is that implied in this is, is he wants to partner with us that we're praying this because we're gonna have an impact on this. Now, some churches, and this is part of my church background, some churches will say something like, you know, you can, you can never really know God's will. 
And uh, so what you do is you pray, but then at the end of the prayer, you always say, if it be thy will. How many of you have heard something like that? Okay, so, so that's what part of the church says. And, and we would not, we, we as a church would not be, you know, in, in agreement with that. We're not hostile or angry, but, but we would see it very, very different. So if you say, if it be thy will, then you say, so if it happens, then it must have been God's will. And if it didn't happen, then it must not have been God's will. And so th- those are some perspectives. But we would hold that God wants us to know his will. And, and so how do, you, how do you know God's will? Well, I, I want today to give us four filters that, that we can look at to, to discern uh, whether something is God's will or, or not. And um, as we do this, we're gonna do this sort of on a global scale today, and then next week we'll come down and be a little bit more particular. But, but we, wanna, we wanna know, God, what, what is your will and how can we know? And so uh, again, God has given at least four filters that we're gonna look at today that when I'm praying about something, I can run through these four filters and say, okay, that's God's will. Or I can say, no, that's, that's not God's will. So as uh, we get into this, and again, I realize that we all come from many church backgrounds. We all have deeply rooted concepts of God. But um, um, so, so keep an open mind as, as we go. Uh, are you good so far? Okay. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. If you've been here for any length of time, you, you've heard some of this. But uh, you tell me if you believe this is true there on your outline. Um, it, from Malachi, God says, I, the Lord, do not change. How many of you believe that's true? Okay, good, good, good. I think it is too. James would say in the New Testament, whom there's no variation or shifting shadow. He's always the same. He does not change. And uh, here's one. In Hebrews, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Then it goes on to say, do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings. So, so here, how many of you believe that he's the same yesterday, today, and, and, and forever? Good. Good, so, so what we would say is God has never changed, therefore his will has never changed. His will has never changed. There are those who would teach that God has changed, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And there in that little verse, he says, Christ Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then he says, but do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings. Uh, those who think that God has changed or that his will has changed, he would say that's a varied and strange teaching and you wanna stay away from, from that. Now, Peter would say this. Peter says, God is no respecter of persons. Now, what does that mean? That means that God does not show favoritism. How many of you believe that that is true? Okay. How many of you say, I believe it because it's in the Bible, but I struggle with it? All right, guys, how many of us think that God likes our wives more than he likes us? I, 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 I sometimes struggle with it. I, I know theologically that this is true, but deep down, I think that he likes Cheryl a little bit more than me. So, um, <laughs> But many times what happens, we have this God that doesn't change, he never changes, but many times we struggle with God, what is your will? And he's the God who doesn't change. So one day in the New Testament, the Pharisees come to Jesus and they ask him a question, there on your outline, and it says, some Pharisees came to Jesus testing him and asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all. Now what they're, they're saying, another way of saying this, is it God's will for us to be able to divorce our wife whenever we want to? And uh, Jesus responds and he quotes Genesis chapter two. It goes back to the very beginning. It goes on. He answered and said to them, have you not read that he who, and I've underlined, created them from the beginning, made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh so that they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, whatever God has joined together, let no man separate. So when they came to Jesus and they said, what is your will as far as divorce goes and and marriage? Uh, Jesus just pointed them back to the very beginning. He pointed them back to the creation. He pointed them back to how God set it up. And uh, so the first filter that we're going to use, and you wanna write this down, is that to know God's will, just look at the garden. How did God create it? How did he set it up? How did he set it up? And uh, so so that was in the garden. And then we know that's chapter two, 
chapter three, sin enters in, man's condition changes, and so the question is when man's conditions change in chapter three, did God change or did man's condition change? We would say man's condition changed, but God never changes. He, he, so that's why Jesus says, no, if you wanna know God's, we'll just look back at the very beginning. Now, let, let me just, just say um, at the front end of this um, that that doesn't always work out the way that you had hoped, that you had hoped. Uh, but the, the idea is that God never changed. God never changed. So uh, nobody stands at the altar and says, I'm committing my life, and then seven years later, you, know, you, you mean it when you commit it, but, but sometimes some things happen. We live in a fallen world. Sin enters in. But the point is that God never changed. That's how he created it, and that's how he, he set it up. Does that make sense? So he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if you want to know God's will, just go back to the garden, how he created it, how he set it up, and, and just know that he never changed. When man sinned, man's condition changed, but God did not change. So God's still the same, even though man's condition changed. So in the garden, you look back at the garden and you ask, in the garden, uh, was it God's will for Adam and Eve to have not enough or barely enough or was it his will for them to have all that they needed, all that they needed? Well, so I would say that God has never changed uh, so, so it wouldn't be God's will for us to have not enough or barely enough. His will would be for us to have all that, that we, we needed. So God's will is never lack. You never want to go through a difficult time of lack and say, well, it must be God's will. No, God, God never changed, which is why uh, 2,000 years ago when God came to the earth, Jesus comes to the earth and he feeds the 5,000. When you read it in the original language and in the English, they all ate until they were stuffed. And then you find that there were 12 baskets left over because he's not the God of not enough or just barely enough. He's the God of all that you need, all that you need. He has never changed. Our situation has changed, but he never changed. What about this? Would you say that in the, the garden, um, was it God's will for everyone to be healthy? Was, was anybody sick in the garden when he created things? So, so he, in, in the garden, it was his will for everyone to be healthy. But in Genesis 3, when sin enters in, things, things changed. Did God change? We say, no, God didn't change, but man's situation changed. And so now we know that there is now sickness, and sometimes we have to deal with those things, but, but uh, he never changed. So you never want to say when you are experiencing or battling a sickness that this must be God's will, because that's not how God created it. He didn't change. Our situation changed. Which is why in the New Testament, you can never find the story where Jesus is going around and healing and healing and healing. And then he comes to somebody and says, but for you, you know what? I've healed all these people, but for you, something special. Uh, you're gonna have this horrible disease, but in this, I'm gonna teach you something through this. That story is not in your Bible. It is never God's will for you to be sick. Does that mean that sickness ha doesn't happen? No, sometimes it is. But you never want to say, this must be God's will. Does that make sense? Now, always remember that Satan is the one who comes to kill, to rob, and to destroy. But Jesus came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So you never want to attribute what Jesus says, that's what Satan does, and then say, that's what God is doing. Because they're, they're very, very different. Well, go back to the garden. Sometimes somebody will come to me and they'll say, you know, Pastor, we... we you know, we're, we're trying to have a baby and uh, it's not happening and we're starting to wonder, maybe it's not God's will for us to have children. Well, of course it's God's will for you to have children. What was the very first command given in the Bible? It was be fruitful and multiply. Has God changed? God has not changed. Man's condition changed. Sometimes there's some challenges with that taking place, but you never wanna say, well, it must be God's will. God has not changed. Man's condition changed. Um, we live in a fallen world. Things happen, but, but it's not God's will. Uh, somebody will say to me, they'll say, you know, the years are going by. I, I haven't met anybody. Maybe it's just God's will for me to be single. I go, do you want to be single? No, I want to be married, but maybe this is God's will for me to be single. Well, what was the first thing that God said to man or about man in the garden? He says it's not good for man to be alone, which means it's also not good for woman to be alone. 
So you never want to say, he hasn't, cha- you know, he hasn't changed. So you never want to say, well, maybe it's God's will that I'm not married. Uh, of course it is. He's the one who set it up. That's how he created it. Now, there's some other factors. We live in a fallen world. Things don't always work out the way that we want. But you never want to say, it must be God's will because it's not God's will. Always remember that God's plan, his original plan, was the Garden of Eden. Something happened in Genesis chapter three, sin entered in, but God never changed. His will never changed. And uh, so, so you just look back at the creation if you wanna know what is God's will, and, uh, and so that's how he set it up, that, that is his, his will. So when they wanted to know God's will, Jesus just pointed them back to the beginning, back to the garden and said, well, how did God create it? How did he set it up? And he has never changed. God's, God never changes. So in the, in the garden, let me ask you a question. Was everybody that God created in the garden, did every person that God created in the garden, did they have a relationship with God? There's only two. Come on, it's Adam and Eve. It's not a trick question. So, so the, the, everybody that he created, he created them because he wanted to have a relationship with them. Now, does everybody have a relationship with God now? So the question is, when man sinned, did God's will change? Does he now say, there in the garden, everybody I created, I wanted to have a relationship with, but now I create some people and I wanna have a relationship with them, but other people I create and I don't wanna have a relationship with them. Uh, has God changed or is his will the same as it was in the garden? He still wants a relationship with everybody, which is why Peter would tell us there in your outline, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, so it doesn't always work out that way, but, but it's always God's will that they come into a relationship with him. Does that make sense? So the first filter you wanna look at is how did God create it? How, how, would, how did he set it up in, in the garden? Then the second filter um, is, is this, that we are created in his image. We are created in his image. There in your outline in Genesis 1, it says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, this is not saying that we are the same height as God. We have the same hair color. That's not what he's talking about. But what he is saying is that there is so much that we can learn about God by looking at ourselves because we are unique in the creation in that we are created in the image of God. God refers to himself as our father, our father. And uh, so as, as parents, there's things that we can look at, desires that we have, and we get that because we are created in the image of God. So the reason that you care about your children uh, beyond the place where they are weaned and they learn how to walk, uh, the reason you care for them uh, is because you are created in the image of God. Animals typically get them out as soon as they're weaned, they can walk, they're, they're done. Animals uh, typically flock together for safety, not for relationship. But he says he is our father and there's this desire for family relationship. So because um, you are created in the image of God, uh, one of the things that you can always ask yourself is what would I want for my child? What would I want for my child? Because he's our, our father. So do you want to see your children, parents have not enough, barely enough, or do you want them to have all, all that they need? All that they need. What would you want for your kids? Well, if you want them to have all that they need, that's because uh, you are created in the image of God. The animal kingdom doesn't really care, but, but you're created in the image of God. What about this? Do you wanna see your children grow up and have healthy relationships, a good marriage? Uh, you wanna see them uh, do well in the world? You wanna see them be able to provide for their families? Or do you wanna see them just constantly struggle, have horrible relationships, divorce after divorce, what would you want? What, you, you want them to grow up, you want them to flourish, you want to see them prosper, you want to see them have good relationships. Do you, do you want to know why you, you want that for your children? Because you are created in the image of God. Uh, animals don't really care about their offspring spouses. They don't care about that. They don't care about how their offspring do in life, but you do because you're created in the image of God. Well, what about this? Now, as parents, do you want your children uh, to have some kind of disability which keeps them from enjoying all that life can provide 
and keeps them from doing all the things that other children get to do? Or do you wanna see your children healthy? What do you want? What, do, you, do you wanna know why? Uh, you, so let me ask you, would you ever wish upon your child a horrible disability so that they would have to be totally dependent on you uh, so that they could find out how much you love them? Or do you say, no, I want them healthy so they can go and, and, and live life and, and do, do great things? Is that, that would, well, the reason that you want that is because you are created in the image of God. And uh, it's so interesting because some of you parents, right now, you are moving heaven and earth to, to heal, fix some disability. You're going to every doctor, every, every, every specialist that you can find because inside of you, you want, it, you want your child well. The reason you want that and where that comes from is that you are unique in the creation and that you are created in the image of God. The animal kingdom could not care less, but you do because you're created in the image of God. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So that's the filter. That's the filter. So we ask, how did God create it in, in the creation? How did he set it up? He never changed. He never changes. And uh, then I'm created in the image of God. So I just asked myself, well, how did, how, what would I want for, for my kids? And then filter number three. Filter number three is going to be God's word. What? What, is, what does God have to say about it? Now, because God never changes, you'll notice as you go through the Bible, uh, God will always focus in on things like healing. So there on your outline, it says, praise the Lord. This is from Psalm 103. He says, praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, uh, who forgives all your sins. I've underlined that and heals all your diseases, heals all your diseases. So how many of you believe that God always wants to forgive all your sins? Do you believe that? Always wants to forgive all your sins, but did you notice what he says there? In the same way that he wants to forgive all your sins, he wants all of your diseases healed. Uh, he wants your sins forgiven, and he also wants your diseases healed. Now, you and I live in a fallen world. There is sickness in this world. And uh, sometimes we have to battle that. But you never want to say it must be God's will because God hasn't changed. He didn't set it up that way. You're created in the image of God and his word always points towards healing. Always points towards healing. Another, another very interesting verse in the New Testament from Acts chapter 10. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around, I've underlined, doing good, what's good, and healing all who were under the power of who? The devil, the devil, because God was with him. So what you find in the Bible is that healing is always from God, it's always his, his will. Sickness, however, throughout the Bible, I've just given you one, one verse, is always associated with the work of the devil. It's never associated with the work of God. Now, no one denied that people were sick, but you never wanna say the sickness must be from God. Jesus says, no, if it's from the power of the devil. I came to set you free from that. So you never wanna say something like, God must have sent the sickness to me to teach me something because there is no story, especially in the New Testament, the ministry of Jesus, where, where God sent sickness to teach you something. The story is he came and he healed. That's who he is and he has never changed. So you, you never have to question whether or not God wants you healed. He always wants you healed. It's always his will. Again, we live in a fallen world. It doesn't always work out that way, but it's always his will for that to take place. Now, growing up, uh, in the church, as I did, we were taught that in the Old Testament, God promised material or physical blessings, but in the New Testament, he doesn't promise that anymore. In the New Testament, he promises spiritual blessings, and uh, there were these elaborate arguments for that. And uh, so part, part of my church background was uh, we were taught that, that being poor was actually uh, a sign of spiritual maturity. And, uh, and some of you come from a background uh, where it, if somebody were to say, I'm going to serve the Lord, the first thing they would have to do is take a vow of poverty. How many of you have, uh, have, know what I'm talking about there? See some heads bobbing. Okay, then I, I know your denominational background. So 
Um, and, and so in part of my church background, being poor was considered spiritual. Is that what the Bible teaches? Well, uh, John, and by the way, this is very deeply rooted into us uh, for, for many people. But John, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, reflecting the heart of God, here's what he says there in your outline. He says, beloved, I pray that in all respects, every, every way, that you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers, just as your soul prospers. Now, interesting thing, that word prosper there, I'm not gonna try to pronounce the word. It means to succeed in business affairs or to have a prosperous journey. Like if you're gonna go on a business trip, it's, it's the word that you would say, I want you to go and do well and, and, and hopefully it's very profitable for you. But that word primarily is, is a business term that, that you do well, that you do well in business. So, so that's his heart. And then it says, pray that you would, um, all respects, you may prosper and be in good health. The word for health there just means health. You can look that up. And just as your soul prospers. Would you say that God wants your soul to prosper? Well, here it says he'd like to see you prosper in every, every area of your life, not just your spiritual life. He'd like to see you health prosper. He, he wants to see it. In, that's his will. That's how he thinks. Well, the early church, Paul is going around and he's taking an offering and uh, the people responded to the offering that Paul was receiving. And, uh, and so Paul writes to that church and here's what he says there in your outline. He says, you will be enriched. Now, if you look this up in some of your Bibles, it will say made rich because that's what it means. In every way, every way, so that you can be generous, generous on every occasion and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. So they participated in what God is doing. And Paul said, here's what you can expect. God's gonna step in. He's gonna begin to bless you. And he says, in every way, one of the ways would be financial. And we know that because he says, and when he does that, you're gonna be able to be generous on every occasion. If God was just giving spiritual blessings, then then. The, all the generosity you could say is I'll pray for you brother but, but that would be it but here he's talking about he's going to return that financially to them and, and because of their generosity people are going to begin thanking God so that's very different than what I was taught growing up so the question we want to ask ourselves and we'll write this down is what does the Bible say what does the Bible say and, and we'll go into this a little bit more next week if you're looking at a situation, you say, what does the Bible say about my situation? We have this little booklet that's called God's Promises for Every Situation, and they're all out in the lobby. Just pick one up, and you'll find what God says about your situation. At least you'll say, okay, well, this is what God says, and, and so I can trust that. So I wanna ask myself, well, how did God create it? How did he set it up in the garden? And, uh, and then I wanna say, I'm created in his image, as a father, what would I want for my children? And then the third thing is, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? And then we come to the fourth filter. And uh, here is the fourth filter. Verse 10, it starts with that, your kingdom come, and then it says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, we're gonna go through this more next week, so I'm just gonna highlight some things and then, then we'll go. Um, but he says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the first thing I wanna do as I consider God's will is I wanna start to consider how are things in heaven? How are things in heaven? And then I wanna ask a question, what is God's will in heaven? What's God's will in heaven? You wanna write that down. What's God's will in heaven? So, so let me ask you a couple of questions. In heaven, is, would you say that those in heaven have not enough, barely enough, or do they have all that they need? All that they need. Yes, you, you, you've read the report. Okay, good. So, so you, you know that. All right. So nobody, nobody in heaven is going around with, with need. Okay. Um, what about sickness? Would you say that in heaven that they're just barely getting by, running to the infirmary there in heaven, or, or would you say that there's no sickness in heaven? No sickness in heaven, that's, that's good. Uh, and, and so we would never say in heaven that God is sending sickness on somebody to teach them something because that doesn't happen in, in heaven. What about this? 
You think people are getting along in heaven or would you say that you know, there, there's fights, there's breakups, there's anger, people aren't talking to one another or, or would you say, no, nah, they're all getting along in heaven. Would you say that? Everybody gets along in heaven. That's good, that's good. So in heaven, everybody has all that they need. No one is getting sick. Everyone is getting along. Let me read that again. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So here's what he's saying. If, if that's the case, write this down. Pray that it happens here. Pray that it happens here. He wants us to pray that as his will is in heaven, that that happens here. It's one of the four filters. Now, implied in this, and we'll talk about this a little bit further next week, is that if I don't pray, thy will be done, um, there's a good chance that his will won't be done. And we'll, we'll pursue that a little bit further next week. The follow-up question to that is going to be this. How fast is his will accomplished in heaven? Would, would you say that, that in heaven it's instantly? Or does God say, I want this to happen now? Uh, or somebody say, well, well in, in God's timing it'll happen in heaven. We would say, well, no, in heaven everything happens instantly. Pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He wants it to happen instantly. So the, the reason I say that, and hopefully we'll pursue this a little bit further next week, we have to be careful when we say, I know it's going to happen in God's timing. How many of you have ever heard something like that, in God's timing? Well, there, there's some truth to that, but, but mostly in God's economy in heaven, it happens instantly. I'm gonna suggest that if God wants to do something, it's probably a lot quicker than, than we might think. So God has given us these filters so that we can know what his will is, we can relate to him. So the first thing, how did he set it up in the garden? Because he hasn't changed, he's still the same, still thinks the same. The second thing is I'm created in the image of God, so what do I want for, for my family? What do I want for my children? The third is what does his word say and then, of course, the, the fourth one is, how are things in heaven? How are things in heaven? Now, the, the, the reason I say this is that if you come from a church background like I come from, we were never taught to view God's will through these filters. By the way, did you at least find those interesting today? Good. So, so part of my church background, we were taught that God, in his sovereignty, creates some to go to heaven but then he creates other humans to not have a relationship with him and they're going to go somewhere else. Doesn't sound all that loving to me to create humans, and, but if you look at the garden, you say, no, everybody that he created, he wants to, to be in relationship. Um, some, uh, part of my church background, we were taught that sometimes God sends sickness to us to teach us. And as we go through this sickness, uh, then we become totally dependent on him. And that's where we find out how much he loves us. You ever heard something like that? Yeah, and then uh, many people I know go, well, I'm just gonna not have a relationship with that God because I don't want a God who's gonna send sickness on me so that he can teach me something. Well, he, he doesn't do that. And it's not part of the filters. Others would say, you know, if we, they were taught that, that if you're going to be truly spiritual, you have to go without. You have to go without because, because that's, that's what it means. He wants you poor and broken, barely able to take care of yourself. And, and many people from my church background said, I don't want that. I mean, I personally can be poor without God's help. I don't know about you, but I can get there real quick. But, but they look on at the concept of God that was taught and they said, I don't want it. I don't want it. And so they can never say what this last verse says on your outline. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him because the concept of God that they received, he wasn't all that good and they didn't want it. Does that make sense? So with that, we're gonna pick it up there next week. I would encourage you to go through your life Think about the filters that God has given to us. I know that we have some deeply entrenched views about who God is, 
but consider, and we'll take this a little bit further next week. I'm going to close in prayer. After I close in prayer, if you'd like to receive communion, communion will be served on each side of the stage. Prayer partners will be down in front in the middle. And with that, we'll pick it up there next, next week. Let's pray. Father, we want to know you for who you really are. We know that we all come from many different church backgrounds and uh, we've been taught many different things. But Lord, regardless of our backgrounds, we wanna know who you really are. If you're really good and if you uh, really do have our best interests at heart and your will is really good for us because we wanna walk in that. So first of all, we realize we need to know what it is and then Lord, we'll learn how to walk in that. I thank you for this congregation. I pray that you keep each and every one of us until we meet again. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you next time.